Hey guys, welcome back to Four Eyes, the podcast series that gives you a clear view into the optometry world across Canada and the US. We are your hosts. I'm Dr. Amrit Bilku. I'm Dr. Deepan Carr. Hi, I'm Dr. Ravinda Rindava. And I'm Dr. Alex Kuhn. Today, we're sharing our interview with Dr. Cameron McCrodin, a Canadian optometrist and public speaker located mainly in British Columbia. Dr. McCrodin is all about vision therapy and neurorehabilitation. He went from being anti-vision therapy to running three VT clinics across North America and giving a passionate TEDx talk on the subject of neurovisual performance as well. Dr. McCrodin also published his own book, Optimize, to share stories of his successful VT patients, which helps readers to learn and understand the relationship between our brain and our eyes. He's also a very busy optometrist who is actively involved in COVD, the BC Doctors of Optometry, the Canadian Association of Optometrists, Canadian Vision Therapy and Rehabilitation, NORA, and the OEP. We had an absolute blast talking with Dr. McCrodin in this episode, and we really hope you all enjoyed the discussion as well. Leave us a rating, comment, or share our podcast on your Instagram stories and tag us to let us know what you think. After you finish this episode, make sure to look in the episode description and click the link to hear Dr. McCrodin's TEDx talk, and also click his link to purchase his book, Optimize, and share it with your patients as well. Dr. McCrodin, for our podcast listeners, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in vision therapy and neuro optometry? <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it as a little bit of a short story, but it's, it's kind of a wild one. I actually knew nothing of optometry for a really long time. Um, I grew up wanting to be an engineer. I loved kind of like everything from Lego to building to designing things. Like generally, I just always wanted to find ways to make things better. Uh, I was in engineering at UVic and decided that I didn't really like engineering. I wanted more people connection. Um, you know, I was terrified that I was going to wind up in a small cubicle. So I kind of panicked. I took some time out to do some traveling. And then my dad made me interview people. He was like, you know, go interview doctors, lawyers, optometry, dentistry, find something that you want to do. Um, and optometrists seem to be some of the happiest of the bunch, you know, they weren't on call, you know, they weren't dealing with like decaying mouths or anything like that. <laughs> and, uh, so I went to optometry school where I actually had my first eye exam cause I'd never had one before that. Um, my parents <laughs> didn't know, which, which was kind of ironic. And so then getting through optometry school, I had almost no concept of vision therapy. In fact, I was actually taught by several profs that vision therapy was basically a bunch of quackery. Okay. And I can actually remember being on a, on a, like on one of my rotations and telling somebody don't do vision therapy. You may as well just do pencil push-ups. You know, it's basically placebo effect. And, and I couldn't like want to eat those words harder now. Um, but what happened was I got out into primary care and within my first year out, I was like, I've, you know, I, I escaped engineering. So I didn't have to sit in a small dark cubicle. And here I was sitting in a small dark, you know, sort of cubicle called the exam room. And, and I just felt like I wasn't making enough of an impact for things. Um, and, you know, and, and primary care is amazing. It just wasn't really for me and, and what I felt like I needed to do. So I was going to quit optometry altogether and go back to dental school because I figured if I was going to be unhappy doing my job, I may as well make six times as much money being unhappy. Um, so anyways, a friend of mine introduced me to the OEP and the areas of functional visual stuff. And I got into it and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is just the engineering of our vision. And then I realized that my sister had had these issues as a kid, which was one of the reasons she struggled in school. And, you know, then, so then having that personal connection and tie to it and feeling like I'd sort of found a bit of a purpose within that, um, just, I just devoured as much material in the area as I could. Um, and it was November, 2012, uh, that I opened a practice cold VT only, you know, 1100 square feet and was just like, I need to find a way to make this work. Um, and from there now, you know, it's, it's grown people like us, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, now we're, we've got a 4,000 square foot office here in Victoria, uh, about 2000 square foot office up in Nanaimo, about an hour and 45 minutes away. And I've got a practice in Brooklyn, uh, New York as well, which is a little bit of a wild thing. So my, I think my big piece coming into VT, which was always a little different is 
I've always been a questioner of, of why and wanting to understand the process for things. And I think that was where I struggled with vision therapy in the first place was because it was like people would describe it as like, oh, you do eye exercises to fix someone's reading problem. Whereas like the logical part of me now understands it's like, well, no, if eye movements are part of a reading problem, then of course remediating them will make reading easier. But it's not this like kind of woo woo area. So within that, I basically did everything I could to learn under OEP, COVD, Bob Sanit's courses are amazing. Um, and through all of that, and then kind of like tying it together in meaningful ways. It's like kind of fun and creative in that sense. So that's, I guess that's a bit about me. Um, probably some other important things along there, background wise, I've held jobs and worked everything from sales to energy drink rep to a fishing guide in a remote place where I lived on a ship for four months and didn't touch dry land. Um, so my, my background is like wildly varied, um, but it, it all kind of comes together in some weird way. Um, so I yeah, think that's you a- might be the most interesting person that ever had like told us about their background. <laughs> <laughs> most people are like, yeah, I went to undergrad, then I went to optometry school, then I did a residency and yours is like so twisty yeah. and dirty with all the that, career changes. That's, so that's literally amazing. like the story of my life. I mean, like yeah. I'm a little more settled now. I've got a, you know, I've got an awesome wife and a one-year-old at home, um, you know, and, <laughs> and like, so doing that piece, but no, like when I took my year off of school, I backpacked in South Africa for four months crazy things but it's weird how it sort of comes into you know it comes into play yeah absolutely so um dr mccroden you kind of already talked about this just a little bit but you successfully run multiple vision therapy clinics so what are some recommendations (laughs) they are very (laughs) successful come on (laughs) So what are some recommendations you would give to someone that is interested in starting their own vision therapy clinic? Like any advice for determining the location, patient demographics, marketing strategies, and the type of equipment you initially purchase? So this is often a funny one because I see a bunch of stuff on the Facebook forums around the business plan and all of these things and, and all of that. And In my experience, it was kind of funny because I didn't even do a plan. I did some rough math on the back of a napkin to figure out if I could make it work. (laughs) And I figured if it won't, then I'll just do primary care and I can still pay off the lease and I'll survive. Like I won't go bankrupt. Um, I I was fortunate too, because I just, I, they hadn't closed off my student line of credit. So I borrowed on that to do it for the first space. But the nice part about VT is location. You've got to think of very differently than regular optometry, you know, regular optometry. Often we want somewhere with high foot traffic, high awareness, et cetera. Nobody walks by a vision therapy practice and is like, you know what? I think my kid needs that. Um, You know, so the, the other difference from the vision therapy practice standpoint is sometimes those high volume, high traffic areas are actually a real pain in the butt for people to get to every single week. Um, but I basically looked at, okay, you know, if I'm going to be working with a lot of kids, um, and, and in the beginning I really was now it's only about half of our caseload, you know, I looked at, okay, for after school times, where are terrible traffic pinch points? Like, I don't want to be somewhere that's really hard to get to. So I kind of looked at it going, okay, where do I not want to have an office in terms of bad traffic times that would make it so parents will hate coming here, um, or even adults throughout out the course of a day, but especially kids, it's harder to get them out of school. Um, so I looked at that from a marketing standpoint, I actually took things kind of uniquely. Um, and when I looked at marketing, I didn't have any money to spend on marketing. The best return that I've ever had has actually been educating, um, other professionals and literally anyone who would let me in front of them. So my first year out, whether it was rotary groups, schools, PTAs, um, baseball teams, parent stuff. Like next week I'm giving a workshop for a high performance athletic facility here. And I'm talking about sports, but also the visual parts around concussion and learning too, and tying it in. So the best thing for me for marketing was honestly getting in front of anyone who would listen to me with a presentation that's, you know, not overly wordy and not too educational, you know, think Ted talk. If you can give them interactive demonstrations of stuff, teach them things that apply to them. How can they look for it? How can they, whatever kind of change their view, hammer the things um, and, and give them some value out of it too. But that was one of the best things for marketing. The other thing I did for marketing was I actually figured one of my main referral sources would be other ODs. Okay. The wild part now is I can promise you it isn't. Um, But (laughs) in the beginning, what I did to actually make it so that more people would get to our offices, I actually didn't charge for initial exams. You know, if somebody found us on Google or a friend recommended it or optometrists could refer without having to justify a fee. 
And then I started charging for exams basically as soon as the schedule was pretty much full. Um, so that was sort of like our, our way to help people understand what we do because nobody else in town was doing it. Nobody knew what vision therapy was um, and, and public awareness was next to nothing. Um, blog posts and testimonials are helpful because when people Google terms, often they'll come up with that stuff and it's nice for them to, to you know, read about it. Um, or, I mean, you could just write a book. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> uh, but, but actually get, get it, getting in front of other people and, yeah. and, and connecting with them and letting them see that, you know, you're like, you know what you're talking about, but not in an arrogant way. You can put it in real world terms, you know, either them or their families or their patients will feel comfortable with you. That's the best practice builder. You made a really good point that ODs are not the only referrals that you can get for vision therapy. You know, when you think about patients who have concussions and head injuries, they're seeing their family doctors, their neurologist, their physiotherapist, their uh, physiatrist, their nutritionist. I mean, there, there's so many um, different healthcare practitioners that you can send those letters to and say, hey, if you have a patient with these types of symptoms, send them over. Um, so yeah, you can get a big network. Um, you bring up an interesting one around head injury. Cause what's really common now is, you know, every physio or OT knows what a Brock string is and often ties it into their stuff. Now, originally I was like, like that's an optom, <laughs> that's a vision thing. That's like optometry, you know? And then I realized I'm like, wait, not enough optometrists are even doing this. So they're doing the world a service by getting those pieces out there. Um, but, you know, being able to help teach them in terms of, you know, here's the basic parts of vision that you guys are sort of handling, but here's how to know if it gets out of that depth. You know, here's how to know if it's kind of out of there um, and where those things are tying in. Um, but you're right, outside of ODs are your biggest referrals because oftentimes ODs are, you know, with physios, OTs, GPs, um, and, and depending, sometimes GPs, honestly, your paraprofessionals, like your other allied health providers are often your biggest referral sources because the one problem with ophthalmology and optometry and even some parts of the medicine is they have to unlearn what they learned, you know, whereas other people like teachers and tutors are like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. So, you know, I'll usually counsel people around here, you know, and, and it reminds me, I actually would need to do like up a little marketing card that has it on it so they can easily pass it off. Yeah. Um, but to save your chair time of talking about it, you know, fire them off to the TEDx talk, um, you know, <laughs> hand them the piece there because because often that soft referral is kind of even more important, especially if it's referring it within your own clinic or to another person for that, you know, in terms of going, Hey, you know, I think this is something you could really use. Here's some more information you can dig into it with mm -hmm. um, because then they'll understand why the appointment matters. Cause you're right. Sometimes it's really hard to talk about it. And especially if, if we, explain it in technical terms or things like that, it's like, well, your son has a phoria and the reason, you know, <laughs> Parents just gone. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to find the like the words to kind of explain it. And like for our listeners who haven't seen your TEDx talk, um, I think it's one of a great um, TEDx talk because the way you explain um, BT and like the analogy you use about like them being on like a broken bike, I think that's something that the, the parents can easily understand. And like, I definitely love that analogy and I'll be using that in the future for sure. Like when I'm educating um, my patients and my, the parents. Um, are there any new technologies that you've successfully incorporated in your practice that enhances the therapy experience? There, there's a lot that I've successfully not incorporated. Into the practice. <laughs> um, there's certain companies I won't talk about, but uh, <laughs> So no, no. So I'm, I'm like a technology junkie. I, I think one of, and, and I know that I drive my family crazy with this sometimes, but like, I'm always a person for change. Like I, I struggle with stagnancy. So I always want to be making things better, et cetera. We've been through four EMRs um, in the last five years. Um, what are you on now? Uh, we're using Jane right now, which actually isn't made for optometry at Ooh, all. It's I made like for like Jane. physio clinics, chiro clinics, all of that, but yeah. we've made it work like really well. So like it, I don't think it'll hook up with like OCTs and that stuff, but as far as noting, charting, running a schedule, dealing with the back end and payments and all that, it's, it's amazing. It's not great for the optical side of it. Um, but we've also made it work. Um, but as far as technologies go, 
there was something that always stuck out to me that Rob Lewis used to say. He always used to say that if you really know what you're doing, you can do VT with, you know, a deck of cards and a couple of lenses um, because it's not always about the technology. And often we're so attracted to shiny things, um, like so attracted to shiny things. I mean, I've got a right eye right now that acts as a doorstop. Um, I have a vivid vision unit that I think is incredible in a bunch of ways that I haven't turned on in a year. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that is really, really fantastic if it fits your model of practice for certain things. But what I always caution and what I know now about technology is that you really have to look at what's the purpose of what, what you're actually using it for. Can that be achieved in other ways, et cetera? Um, you know, one of the things I really don't like about most VR stuff is that you're actually in an artificial environment as far as visual vestibular stuff goes. You know, you're not actually seeing how the world actually moves around you. Um, I mean, vergence activity stuff is probably one of the top things for computers. Um, we actually just, I was part of a project with a patient of mine. I don't know if you guys know this, um, but we launched a neurovisual trainer, um, dot com. So like shameless plug for something I'm involved with. Um, but it was actually designed as an in-house platform to be able to give patients uh, examples of video of like how to do exercises at home. So if they forgot, or if you have a kid between two households and we wanted a web-based way to do Randot um, and some of the other interactive things. So a patient of mine developed it. And then during COVID, we put it out for free to, for docs to use with their, their patients. And then only now it's, you know, there's a small fee per prescriber or it's unlimited. Um, yeah, but yeah I so had, it's, that's I actually that for my patients cool. during, during uh, COVID. Yeah. So, it so that's great. actually become our go-to one in the office. Yeah. And my favorite thing is, is that, you know, I was just on with a couple of docs at universities today and we were talking about ways to change and develop and better it. So, yeah. you know, as far as technologies go, the technologies, the problem with a lot of them is sometimes they're made by people who have a bit of an idea about one concept in vision and the whole thing centered around that. And, so, and oftentimes it doesn't fit into your patient flow or practice or experience quite the way it should. Like for example, you know, some of the VR systems are amazing, but I can't charge my patients another 200 bucks a month to use that on top of our normal fees when I know that's not going to get them everything they need. And I have other ways of achieving the same things. That's very true. I feel like um, most times during our vision therapy sessions, we would use the more advanced technology looking gadgets as like a reward system, mainly for yeah. the kids because they look cool. So <laughs> we would do a lot of um, activities with really basic equipment, but then having that Binovi board, um, or I think Vivid Vision, we had at ICO, it was always a reward system, which was yeah. <laughs> just a nice little like cherry on top. Yeah. And but it wasn't are, the, the soul of the vision therapy work. No, and, and there are some things that you can only do on those systems. I mean, um, but I think the problem is sometimes I always used to be very vulnerable to the like, oh, this is the coolest new technology. I should have it and try to make it work. Um, and yeah, spent way too much money. <laughs> <laughs> so as we know, children's vision makes up about 80% of their learning. And yet most parents are unaware their child's vision is more than just 2020. So kind of like a big point that your TEDx talks about. Um, <laughs> what are some uh, um, screening questions and observations a primary care optometrist like myself can utilize to identify any learning related vision problems in these kids? Um, I mean, uh, I'd like if, if we look at it, if you look at the statistics, like for a kid who struggles with reading, it's, it's like 80% of them are lacking at least one or more visual skills. So probably the number one screener you could ask is, do you struggle with reading? And, and like, quite frankly, if it's there, you've got a, you know, you've got a four out of five chance that the referral is going to be for, you know, there's going to be something going on. Yeah. You know, I'd almost say quite frankly, that it's even higher than that. You know, I'm, I'm yet to see very many kids who don't have, and it doesn't mean vision's the whole problem. You know, you're entitled to have more than one thing. Um, but I'm, I'd see many kids where um, it's a, vision's always, almost always a component. So I'd say just that one question alone is sort of enough. Um, one of the things I'm a big fan of that Meryl Bowen really made popular, and I'll just show this to you on my phone here. Um, the like binocular dissonance grid or pattern glare. That's a really, really nice one for adults um, who struggle with headaches or migraines or fatigue or various other things. 
when you just have them look at it or even post concussion, it's a good way to tell if they're having visual issues is if they look at that and they're like, Oh, like I don't like that. They're like, that hurts. And you're like, all right, I think we found the spot. Um, and, and, and that's one of the easiest things you can do in primary care too. If you want to tell a vision's a part of like headaches and migraine stuff too. Um, but for kids, honestly, sometimes just the question, um, you know, how, how are they doing with reading? You know, how do they do with small ball sports? You know, is your kid clumsy at all? And, and they don't have to have all of those areas impacted. That's, a, that's another common misconception is like, well, if my kid's eyes don't track properly when reading, why are they so good at sports? And it's like, well, they could have the problem only in here and not out there. Distance, yeah. You know, you, you don't have to check off all the things on the list. Mm -hmm. What's um, that grid called again? Sorry. The, oh, the grid? Uh, that's pattern glare um, pattern or the glare. binocular oh, okay. aliasing test. Um, there's a number of different names, but if you Google pattern glare, it pops up. Um, that already say, gave me a, I was like, mm, I don't want to look at that. <laughs> so you need somebody to prescribe you what Bob Sanit calls neurofunctional lenses. Or like, <laughs> I, I, I kind of use the term sometimes ergoptics. You know, it's glasses yeah. that don't just make things clear, but make it more efficient. And, yes. and I actually was in a study with UVic um, and COVID kind of got things closed down a bit, but we'd shown with an EEG, if you put the right lenses in front of somebody when they're looking at this, you can actually measure a different response neurologically to that pattern. It does not set off such sort of like a trigger with that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. But no, as primary care, you know, struggle with reading um, or yeah. spelling or writing, really those things like it should be fully tested just to be ruled out. Yeah. Yeah, you spoke too soon about ergoptics. We really yeah. want to talk about it a lot more. Um, I do want to add one other thing. I know... Um, I think just last week, I also made an observation on one of my nine-year-old kids. Even when you're having the kids read um, like a near card to measure near VAs, she started using her finger to read every single letter. And that just prompted the question, do you always use your finger to read? And her and mom said, yeah, all the, her whole life. And that actually prompted her to get a visual um, skills assessment and enrolling her in BT because this is something that, you know, is related to eye tracking difficulties. Her DEM showed that the readalyzer showed that. So those little things that you can pick up, even just observing how they're reading your near card, are they squinting? Are they kind of tilting their head? Are they pausing? Uh, things like that might help too. So Dr. McCroden, you have published a book called Optimize, which you mentioned earlier. So that book outlines the impact vision can play in concussion rehabilitation, headaches, and dizziness. And like we've mentioned, you even had a TED Talk to further discuss the topic with a wider audience. So how did you come about writing Optimize and what inspired you to start educating others on neurovisual performance? Um, <laughs> so I'd probably say that my whole life, whenever I've liked something, like I was like the person who had Maui gyms on and I'm like, you have to try these on, like, like look through these two, or if it like some kind of, you know, drink or food or anything, like I always wanted other people to, to try it and see it and experience it and get it. Um, so much of our population is affected by these things. And so many people are done a disservice, you know, probably four or five times a week. I have patients in my chair in here in tears because other people have dismissed their issues like completely um, or because the kids issues weren't picked up or they've been told they've been sort of been faking it. Like I have a woman in her seventies, she's told she was faking her problems her whole life. Um, so, so the awareness piece is around the greater societal understanding we can have of these visual conditions. I mean, the more we can make sure that kids aren't left struggling unnecessarily, or the more we can help adults get back to work, get back to performance and sort of understand that. And I think we're sort of at a cusp of where it's coming. Um, so to help get that out there more, you know, to share the stories of patients of mine with some of the science in behind it in a way that's accessible to the general reader to pick it up um, and to, and to kind of go through it. Um, and to even share some of the stuff from like a, a, a bit of a skeptics approach for things. Like I have lots of patients in here, dads, and they're like, you know, I was pretty skeptical of this at first. And I was like, yeah, so was I. And they just like kind of look at me and sort of laugh and, uh, you know, to sort of at least share a bit of my journey in that and, and yeah, just help drive awareness to everyone. Yeah. I even tell patients cause my dad actually went through vision therapy, uh, when he was growing up. So I tell patients that my dad did it and actually helped him. And that tends to help them understand a little bit as well. 
So Optimize also expands on how an inadequate glasses prescription can contribute to headaches, dizziness, reading, and attention problems. How can we determine whether the patient's glasses prescription is the cause of these problems? So I wouldn't always say that the prescription doesn't necessarily often have to be the cause, but whether it's actually helping or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so a great example with myself is going through university, I could only read or study for about three or four pages at a time before I kind of lose my focus, drift off and have to do something else. Okay. And as you can tell, I'm generally a somewhat high energy person anyway. So I was like, oh, this is clearly just my attention issues. Um, I didn't realize it was actually a visual problem. If I studied for long enough driving in the car, I'd sometimes have to sort of really blink and try to like stay focused, not realizing that my eyes were actually kind of over converging, et cetera. So when we look at glasses, I, th I think there's a couple fundamentals that we often ignore. You know, one, the human visual system is not made for extended periods of near work. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we are not designed for that. And so I think first off is looking at it like reading is no more natural to us than is sitting in a chair. And, you know, and there's things we need to do to address the problems that come up from sitting in bad posture, et cetera, et cetera. So the first is to kind of look at that. The second piece is, you know, and, and this is where the engineering nerd in me kind of, kind of gets a little crazy, but looking at what winds up happening with lenses as we're using them. So, and I was just lecturing this for my staff earlier today, but Oftentimes we don't think about the consequences of the lenses that we're using either. So, you know, a minus lens, you know, not only, you know, yes, it helps those who are myopic nearsighted, you know, shifting the sort of focal point and diverging light, but it also minifies the world, you know, also the second they're looking off the center of the lens, there's induced prism in it as well. And of what we usually have to look at is just how do we make a lens that's most efficient for that person for, for exactly what they're using it for. Um, you know, sometimes you might need to use bits of prism to compensate for the minifying effect of a minus lens, et cetera. Or, you know, you might need to use an ad if there's way too much convergence drawn in when somebody's, you know, at near or extended computer screen time, et cetera. Um, or sometimes yoked prism will, you know, help compensate for, again, the effects of the lens. So it's, it's really about looking at, you know, is the lens for just for clarity or is it for efficiency as well? Um, and the problem is sometimes is as a profession, um, we've gotten kind of lazy and we believe too much of the marketing that comes through from a lot of the lens companies. So the lens reps like hate me because they come in and they're like, they're like, well, here's this computer lens that actually allows you to see at all distances. And I'm like, you realize that's optically impossible, right? Like you can't, <laughs> you can't have somebody in the right prescription for using their computer and they can see the end of the room in that, like that, that's not how this works. Um, and so taking control of how you design your lenses. So, you know, for computer lenses, I generally just use, you know, anti fatigues of sorts, um, where I can specify the exact prescription in the top and the chain, you know, the ad to the bottom. Uh, and you can kind of take control of that. Same with progressive lenses. Don't let them throw yoked prism in your progressive lenses in the, you know, prism thinning part of stuff, unless you want it there. So the, the, the pieces around prescribing, um, really come into making sure that people are using glasses that are set up in a way for them that is, that is actually efficient. And yes, it's a pain in the butt. Sometimes people are like, oh, well, I was told that my one pair of glasses should do everything. And I was like, you know, what do you think your life would be like if you had one pair of shoes that does everything? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, you'll look terrible at the wedding and have sore feet when you run. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so that's, I think that's where sometimes though it's easier as a profession when you're firing through 15 minute exams or whatever, to just be like, here's your prescription and let an optician somewhere actually, mm -hmm. you know, change your prescription, change the lens designs. Like, yeah. So, so, so that's, I, I almost have this like anal retentiveness over how lenses are being used and how they're prescribed. So erg optics is basically just the cheesy term that we basically put on functional lens prescribing. It was like, how do we try to communicate this to people in a way that isn't like a big wordy thing about how the glasses make it better? Um, I mean, it's, it's probably beyond the scope of the podcast to try to explain all of the parts to it. But mm -hmm. if you've been through SANIT courses, if you've been through OEP, there's all these bits and pieces of how to do that stuff. Um, you know, with a lot of my dizziness and vestibular patients, I'm investigating different yoked prism or micro prism or whatever by having them do dynamic visual acuity with it on. I can see immediately, you know, is the ratio correct? Are they able to maintain fixation through head movement or not? Does it make them more dizzy? Does it make them less dizzy? 
using the tools like the pattern glare up close. So here, here's one simple thing I can give you that'll actually, you know, for, for those in dispensing practices and stuff, it'll, it'll pay to be able to go to some OEP courses, this one, literally this one trick. So what happens is if you take somebody who's a progressive lens wear, okay. And you're like, fantastic. Are these the glasses you wear at your computer? And they go, yes. And you go, okay, want to see something cool? How far away is your computer from you? So they'll show you how far away it is. And then you take this with your screen on bright. So that's that pattern glare screen on bright and hold it from them where their computer is and go, okay, how, how does it feel looking at this right now? And most of them will do this. And you go, okay, <laughs> did you see what you just did with your neck? And they're like, uh, oh yeah. And you're like, do you want to buy your physio a new car? Um, <laughs> and then, so what you do then is basically then take what you've determined, you know, with your fused cross sill, other tests that you're going to do, what you've determined to be the best near prescription. And out of the gates, if you want to start the most simple, th go fuse cross sill. That's what tells you where something was. When I started out, I was told to do ads based just on age. That is a terrible way to do it. But mm -hmm. fuse cross sill, if you take a flipper with fuse cross sill and drop it over top of their progressive, so you go, okay, put your head in good posture, drop the flippers in with whatever the fuse cross sill is and go, okay, now how does it feel to look at that? And it's generally like, ah, oh, that's so much better. You know, and then you go, perfect. You spend so much time on a computer. We need to make sure your vision's not a big part of your issues. You know, and I'll often ask them, does this feel like this is going to give you a headache or strain? And they're like, yes. Pop the flipper down with the right plus. Oh, no, not at all now. And it's like, good. That's why I want to make sure you have a pair of lenses that's going to do that for you while you work. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then prescribe them that with the fuse cross sill ad in the top and whatever in the bottom. Hoya makes awesome lenses for doing that. You know, whether it's the 50, 75, 125 ad, um, I use their sync lenses and stuff. I, I use almost exclusively Hoya and I'm not paid by them. This is not a plug. It's just their lens designs are some of my favorites because I'll lensometer everything. And I'm sure other companies have great ones, but those, that's just what I've been using. Now, the other thing that you can do, which makes a massive difference there is to go, you know, sometimes people hum and haw. One of the easiest things, especially if you have control over your dispensary is to go, okay, look, I'll tell you what, if you get these lenses and you don't love them within a few weeks, bring them back. I'll either change them and it won't cost you for me to change it or I'll refund you on it. Mm -hmm. And the funny part about that is guess what? If somebody really wasn't happy, then you would have done that for them anyways, mm -hmm. right? Like if they don't like their glasses, you're going to change them. And if they really don't like them, you're probably going to refund them. But if you tell the person that up front in the exam room, they're like, whoa, I have a no hassle trial of this where I can see it. And if you've prescribed that properly, I've gotten like, I think one that I've actually returned in five years. If you do that in a dispensing practice, you will make <laughs> yourself enough extra income, have enough other patients who can see why they need to solve that problem and really happy people. Like those are the people they'll tell you, I don't know how I lived without these. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not like a negative sales thing. You're just communicating them why they need it, which is often a problem for us. As our last question, but it's an important one. What do you say to other healthcare professionals or patients who question the effectiveness of vision rehabilitation and neurooptometry? And what resources do you prefer to use and recommend to others when learning new information about vision rehabilitation? I mean, I, I, think, I think it depends on, you know, who's questioning and whatever. There's some people whose minds you're never going to change for stuff. And, and, it's, and it's honestly just like a lost cause. Um, one of my favorite ones was I had a neuro ophthalmologist tell somebody that vision therapy wasn't going to help them and blah, blah, blah. And so I turned to the patient and I said, look, I'm so sure that my treatment will help you. I will guarantee what I do. If, if I'm wrong, I won't charge you a penny. I'll, I'll cover the cost, but it also means I'll kick you out if you don't put the work in. I was like, ask him if he's so <laughs> sure of his opinion that he will pay for it. If he's wrong, of course not. Um, <laughs> But, you know, so, so oftentimes I just took the argument part out of it or sometimes even with certain people where I'm like, look, like, like if I, if I'm wrong and I can't actually help someone like I, and you know, I have to cut maybe a, a check or two back a year, maybe one a year, but we actually have a guarantee in our office. Um, and again, part of that comes out of almost business practice. Like if, 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 if you do vision therapy for somebody and they're really unhappy and it really sucked, you're actually better off to just refund them and then not have them out there talking poorly about it. You know, instead, all of a sudden it becomes a story of like, he thought it would work and he didn't, but he refunded me. Like, what do you have to be mad about? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've actually made that a little bit more of a public policy. 
you know, we actually have it with people, you know, that we will guarantee, you know, that not that things will be perfect, um, but that they'll be happy with the outcomes, you know, based on our goals that we went into it with. Um, with other professionals, sometimes I'll point them like Patrick Quaid's got a great new book. Um, was it uh, Suter and Harvey? Um, Vision Rehabilitation, you know, that blue one. Uh, that's an amazing book for the actual neurology. So when I'm, when I have to do court cases, that's like one of the things that I heavily reference. But, but again, sometimes it depends on people's ideas of what it is, um, you know, and, and what they think vision rehab is. But I, I don't know, these days I don't spend as much time arguing with people anymore. I'm like, look, we've been open for eight years with a gar- like satisfaction guarantee in place. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, what have you been doing then for eight years if it doesn't work? How are you still yeah. <laughs> Big, Biggest scammer in the world, right? Like, yeah. come on. Like, we have a, we have, I should actually, um, here, it's going to change the sound just a second. But I'll actually show you. Like, this is what you see when you walk in to our office. Um, oh, it's not lighting it up completely. But this is actually just like a giant covered wall of like, thank you cards. Aww. And stuff. So, I mean, it took me a long time to write all of those. But... <laughs> <laughs> well now you'll have you have the one-year-old you can have the one-year-old help out you know yeah. you, you, years, be good. you know that's always such a great idea too with um you know some vt practices will have you know pictures of their patients holding a certificate and put the little polaroids up on the, the wall um or they'll write little thank you notes that they put up on the wall so obviously the more successful patients you can show off will really convince other people that this is something that can help them too and, and put your energy into the people who get it. You know, yeah. like, like I've, I've watched colleagues spend hours writing retorts and replies and all of this stuff to like, you know, to the ophthalmologist or to neuro or to another optometrist or whoever. But if you spent that same energy connecting with the people who, who like you and believe in what you do and, 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 and united that, I mean, not only that though too, but if in your exam, you know, for, especially for the ones where it comes down to two different sources, you know, it's like, oh, this person said it won't work. And, and I saw you and you said it will. Generally speaking, if, if you haven't built enough trust with that person and shown them even where some of the improvements can be and made that connection, um, you know what, like thank the other professional for taking them out of your practice. Um, because quite frankly, that's somebody who would have been dissuaded by something else along the way anyways, you know, but if you have a head injury patient sitting there and you've shown them how changes to their glasses can change their dizziness and they felt it that day. And then somebody else comes along and says, that's not real. Like, you know, like people aren't (laughs) dumb. Like if I can leave sort of one simple sort of take home from that part Mm -hmm. um, on the, on the prescribing side of things, use that fuse cross cylinder, use that Mm -hmm. way of showing somebody with a flipper about computer lenses for stuff. Um, Even if you're not going to do any VT, if you can get them into better lenses for when they're working, it makes a massive difference Mm -hmm. in their life, whether they're going home, less irritable, popping less Tylenol, whatever it is. Um, And I actually do that demo on a lot of parents. So, so usually if I have a family member in with somebody for an appointment, I will often demo some stuff on them too. I'll be like, you know, if a kid's there and I'm prescribing the kid reading glasses, I'll look at the parent and not only will I demo what it's like to have a problem, but I might do just a super fast ret and a couple little things and then pop in a prescription just in front of the parent and go, you know, do you notice the difference on the black and white lines, you know, or whatever. And oftentimes it's like, whoa, that feels so much nicer. And I'm like, and now look what it does for your reading. And they're like, oh, wow. Like, I was like, do you, do you notice a difference in smoothness or movement? And they're like, absolutely. And then not only do they understand that the kids' glasses aren't for clearness, they're to help with efficiency and function, but then oftentimes they usually walk out of here going, okay, now I need an appointment too, which <laughs> yeah. is also another great like practice builder. You know, you're educating <laughs> and, you know, helping more people. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you again for being on the podcast, Dr. McCroden. It actually was so much fun. You're so enthusiastic about vision therapy and we're happy that you are because all the stories that you talked about were hilarious and we learned so much about um, what you were talking about. So that's awesome. But thank you so much again well, for th- coming on. Thank you for having me. I'm glad, I'm glad we finally got to connect and maybe we'll get yeah. to do it again sometime too. So yeah. Yes, hopefully. Oh yeah, definitely. Thank you to everyone for listening to Four Eyes. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe and leave us a rating to give us feedback on how we're doing. You can also check us out on Instagram at Four Eyes Optum for more content. Look out for new episodes every Wednesday. So until then, stay tuned. Mm